Welcome to section three of neurology. This section is divided into two parts. In the first part of this section, we'll be introducing cranial nerves and going through several examples. In the second part, we'll focus on examples and we will integrate the remaining material. So let's get started. The first topic is the corticobulbar tract. This is figure 8.5 from your text, which shows a coronal view of the brain. For step one, you need to know that the corticobulbar tract is a cranial nerve pathway that connects the upper motor neurons to the lower motor neurons. Remember, all motor information originates from upper motor neurons in the primary motor cortex. This remains true when we talk about the cranial nerves. So an upper motor neuron originates in the primary motor cortex, which we'll assume is about right here, this region where I'm drawing circles. And these neurons send axons down through the brain and through the internal capsule. So down through the internal capsule. Recall from section one that the corticobulbar tract passes through the genu of the internal capsule. Once past the internal capsule, the axons decussate just above each lower motor neuron in the brainstem. Let's imagine that this represents the brainstem. We'll say this is the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. So again, the lower motor neurons of the cranial nerves are located within the brainstem, which I'll draw here. These are also called cranial nerve nuclei. It's important to know that many of the cranial nerve nuclei span large segments of the brainstem. So for example, while the trigeminal cranial nerve may emanate from the pons, the nucleus of the trigeminal cranial nerve may actually be seen in the pons, medulla, and even part of the cervical spinal cord. Okay, once the axons from the upper motor neurons pass the internal capsule, they decussate directly superior to the cranial nerve nucleus that they innervate. So for example, the third and fourth cranial nerve nuclei are in the midbrain. So we'll write the third and fourth. So the axons innervating these nuclei would cross over right above that region. So again, this is the left side of the brain and this is the right side of the brainstem. So this blue circle would represent the third and fourth cranial nerve nuclei on the right side of the brainstem. Obviously, the opposite side of the brain would do the same thing. It would cross over directly above the lower motor neuron that is innervated. This same principle holds true for all the cranial nerve nuclei receiving motor information from the primary motor cortex. Finally, it's important to recognize that the corticobulbar tract is quite complicated and lesions of the tract are fairly unpredictable. So please don't spend time memorizing all of the intricacies of the cortical bulbar tract. If you understand the general idea and the pathway we just covered, you'll be well prepared for step one. Okay, with this in mind, let's look at cross sections of the different levels of the brainstem to look at each of the cranial nerve nuclei. This is figure 8.16, which shows a transverse section of the midbrain. This is anterior and this is posterior. For step one, you need to be able to recognize a transverse section of each level of the brainstem. The midbrain can be easily identified by the cerebral crura, which are right here. I use this to remind me that the midbrain looks like two legs, so kind of like this. You could also use the substantia nigra, which is this dark pigmented region right here, or the red nucleus, which is this region right here. These will both help remind you that you're looking at a section of the midbrain. Okay, with this in mind, let's look at the cranial nerve nuclei in the midbrain. Again, as I mentioned on the previous slide, many of the cranial nerve nuclei span large segments of the brainstem. However, as a general rule of thumb, the nucleus of the cranial nerve can be found wherever the peripheral branch emanates from the brainstem. So, for example, the peripheral branches of cranial nerves three and four emanate from the midbrain. So we can deduce that the nuclei for these cranial nerves must also be in the midbrain. The peripheral branches of cranial nerves five through eight emanate from the pons, 
So we can deduce that the nuclei for these cranial nerves must also be in the pons. The peripheral branches of cranial nerves 9 through 12 emanate from the medulla. So we can deduce that the nuclei for these cranial nerves must also be in the medulla. One exception to this rule is the nucleus of cranial nerve 11. The nucleus of cranial nerve 11 resides in the cervical spinal cord, but the peripheral branch of this nerve emanates from the medulla. Finally, remember that cranial nerves 1 and 2 do not emanate from the brainstem. So in this case, we're looking at a section of the midbrain, so we should expect the nuclei of cranial nerves 3 and 4 to be present here. I find it helpful to keep in mind that most of the cranial nerve nuclei are directly adjacent to the cerebral aqueduct or fourth ventricle. We'll talk about this in more detail later, but recall that the cerebral spinal fluid moves from the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct. In this image, we can see the cerebral aqueduct right here. With this logic, we'd expect the nuclei for cranial nerves 3 and 4 to be close to the cerebral aqueduct, which they are. From this figure, we can see the nucleus of the oculomotor nerve, or cranial nerve 3, right here. We can't see the nucleus for the trochlear nerve, or cranial nerve 4, because it's directly inferior to the oculomotor nucleus. However, if we took a cross-section of the midbrain directly below this region, we'd have a very similar figure, and we'd be able to see the trochlear nucleus. For your reference, this is a myelin stain of an actual microscopic cross-section of the midbrain. For step one, it's important for you to be familiar with these myelin stains of the brainstem. You need to be able to recognize what segment of the brainstem you're looking at and have a general idea of the location of the major landmarks. Okay, now let's look at a cross-section of the pons. This is figure 8.18, which shows a transverse section of the pons. Again, this is anterior, and this is posterior. The pons can be easily identified by the transverse pontine fibers, these little fibers right here. If you can't find the transverse pontine fibers, then you should still be able to deduce that you're looking at the pons by process of elimination. This is because the midbrain and the medulla have a very distinct appearance. Okay, with this in mind, let's look at the cranial nerve nuclei in the pons. Recall that cranial nerves 5 through 8 emanate from the pons. Remember, most of the cranial nerve nuclei are directly adjacent to the cerebral aqueduct or fourth ventricle. I'm not going to go through each of the cranial nerve nuclei, but I'd like to briefly mention the importance of the solitary nucleus. For step one, you need to know that the solitary nucleus is a large nucleus that spans much of the brainstem and contains sensory information for cranial nerves 7, 9, and 10. I use the letter S in the word solitary to help remind me that this nucleus contains sensory information. Rather than memorizing all of the details of cross sections of the brain, I find it helpful to use a landmark called the sulcus limitans as a guide to answering many of the cross-sectional questions you'll see. The sulcus limitans, which is approximately right here, is useful because it divides the sensory nuclei from the motor nuclei. Those nuclei lateral to the sulcus limitans are sensory, and those nuclei medial to the sulcus limitans are motor. I use the letter M in the word medial to help me remember that the nuclei medial to the sulcus limitans are motor nuclei. So in summary, if you can identify what section of the brainstem you're looking at, and you know that the nuclei located laterally are associated with sensory information, then you should be able to get all the step one questions correct that are associated with this topic. For your reference, this is a myelin stain of an actual microscopic cross-section of the pons. We can clearly see the transverse pontine fibers right here.